May I ask something? I just wanted English. Oh, okay, so I'm supposed to speak English. Okay, thank you.
Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. We're all set now. We're all set back here. Thanks, Mike.
another one. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the BRD's second session of our civil society's uh, program at the annual meeting. This panel discussion uh, is organized and led by E3G, our partner, on the role of civil societies in sustainable energy transition. My name is Solana Koval. I'm head of private sector partnerships and civil society engagement team. One of the central features uh, and themes of today's uh, panel related to urgency of accelerating the transition away from dependency on fo uh, fossil fuel. Redefining energy security to include both supply and demand measures is a good first step. But actions to fast uh, track energy efficiency and renewable energy deployment in the short term are still necessary. Today's discussion will provide uh, an opportunity to consider the ongoing global challenges such as supporting economic growth, combating climate change, and strengthening the business and environments in the region of the bank uh, where we invest, among other topical themes. And of course, the war on Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, I would like to mention that our today's session is uh, translated in three languages, French, uh, Arabic, and English, of course. And now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator uh, of today's panel, Ms. Sonia Dunlop, uh, the program leader of public banks at E3G. Her areas of expertise include alignment with the Paris Agreement uh, at the multilateral development banks, coordination of networks of governments uh, to drive change and climate-related policies at development finance institutions. Prior to joining E3G, Sonia spent 10 years working at the uh, European Parliament, the solar PV industry, and the UK Parliament working th uh, throughout to affect change in key renewable energy policies and legislations. Sonia, over to you. Thank you so much, Solena. Thank you. Um, so, salam alaikum, everyone, and welcome to this event on sustainable energy transitions and particularly the role of civil society in that energy transition as well. Super important, super important, not just for the climate, but also for, as we are learning right now in this current crisis, for energy security and for our national security, and also in terms of the affordability of our energy supplies. I'm really keen to hear from you in the audience today, both here in the room and online all over the world. So please get involved. There are two main ways to get involved. The first is get involved on Twitter. 
tell us what you think, whether you agree or disagree with what we're saying. The hashtag is hashtag E-B-R-D-A-M, A-M stands for annual meetings. So let us know what you think on Twitter and we will um, uh, draw on that as well in this debate. And you can also go on to slido.com um, to post your questions to myself, to the other members of the panel, to the members of the panel online. So slido.com, where you enter the number 91700, and, uh, and there you'll be able to choose the room FES1 and the Sustainable Energy Transitions event, and we will be looking at those questions throughout the session and putting them to the panel um, uh, at the end of the session. You can also ask questions in the traditional way by putting up your hand and getting a microphone. So do get involved. We are also, just before I launch into the actual subject matter, we are also going to be having a um, illustrator be turning our words into pictures because a picture is worth a thousand words. So we have Josh, our illustrator here. He says hi. Hi, Josh, um, who will be illustrating and taking everything we say and turning it into a piece of art for you all to put on your walls at home when you get back to your various respective home countries. So that's the logistics over. What are we here to discuss today? We're here to discuss the sustainable energy transition. Super important, as I said, for the climate transition, for, the, for, for dealing with the climate crisis, both in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating emissions, but also adapting to the impacts of climate change. And I'll come to that a bit later. Important in terms of ensuring our energy security and our national security, and important also in terms of ensuring, as we are all finding out now, the affordability of our energy supply as well. I know this, you know, just as well as you do. I am, um, I live in London in a small flat, and I can barely afford my own energy bills. And I'm sure you are all in the same situation. As, as Olena said, I used to work in solar PV. So this is a topic that's very close to my heart. I now I work very much on the MDBs and the public banks, but this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, and solar, I, I really believe, is one of the core cool technologies of the energy transition, um, which will deliver decentralized, uh, decarbonized, and also a democratization of the energy system that is very interesting as well. But we cannot ignore the fact that we are currently living through the Ukraine crisis. And this is really changing the picture in terms of the sustainable energy transition. It's making energy into a much more, an even more political topic. It's making it into a tool of geopolitics. And as is, I think, universally acknowledged now, gas prices, fossil fuel prices, energy prices, electricity prices are soaring. And that completely changes the calculation in terms of the sustainable energy transition. And indeed, is a reason for it to be accelerated. Accelerated. The energy transition that was already under, underway has to be accelerated. But tell me if you disagree. I'm interested in your views. Do you think that natural gas, unabated natural gas, is still a transition fuel, as it's been called for so long, or has that changed? Is it no longer a useful transition fuel? These are the kind of questions we're going to be putting to our panel and trying to get answers to today. And then most importantly, we're here at the EBLD annual meetings. What is the role of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development? What is the role of multilateral development banks? What is the role of the EBRD in all this? EBRD countries of operation include importers and exporters of energy, include buyers of Russian fossil fuels and alternative sources of fossil fuels, does the EBRD then become a broker or an advisor on how to move beyond all this? Um, and I'm also very interested in how this relates to the alignment of the EBRD with the goals of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. This is something that we've been studying in E3G, third generation environmentalism, the think tank I represent for many years now. We have an online tool, the E3G Public Bank Climate Tracker Matrix, where you can see exactly how the EBRD and other banks are doing on Paris alignment and, and, and is a foundational part of making sure that these banks really do their bit in terms of delivering 1.5 degrees and a more resilient world. And then finally, what is the role of civil society organizations in all this? Tell us what you think on Twitter, on Slido, in person, because I really do believe that the stronger CSOs are in this debate, the better answers we will get. So 
without further ado, I want to turn to our panel to get their views. They have five minutes each to discuss um, uh, their views on all these questions and more. And I'd first like to talk to our speaker from EBRD, Harry um, Boyd Carpenter, who is Managing Director of for Green Economy and Climate Action in EBRD, responsible for delivering the 50% green finance target at EBRD by 2025. Although it be interesting to hear what you define as green finance, because that's important too. Formerly, you're very well qualified for this panel because you used to be head of energy in EBRD and used to live in Pristina as well, I understand, which, was, which is uh, uh, also very relevant, and, um, uh, and used to work at Allen & Overy before that, the uh, big law firm. So I'm keen to hear your views on all of these questions and more, and particularly what is the role for EBRD in all this, and how can EBRD help de-risk the key investments that we need to make, like in renewables and in energy efficiency, to make this sustainable energy transition a reality. Harry, over to you. Five minutes for you. Great. Thank you very much, Sonia, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you mentioned, I, I used to be a lawyer, and then I became a banker. And when I made that change, my, my sister said to me, you know, what's next? Estate agent, politician? Um, but I've managed to correct myself and, and move back into, into trying to do something about climate. And, um, you, you asked a lot of very complicated, difficult questions and, um, and then said you've got five minutes to answer them, which under the scrutiny of, of, of this very distinguished audience. So I'll confine myself to two, two issues at this point. One is, what, is the what are the implications for the sustainable energy transition of the current crisis and the, and the war on Ukraine? Um, and secondly, what's the role of EBRD in trying to accelerate that transition? So if you start with the first question, what do we mean by sustainable energy transition? And I keep coming back to three numbers. It's 80, 0, and 28. In other words, right now, we get 80% of our energy globally from hydrocarbons. We have to reduce that number to zero, and we have 28 years to do it by 2050. That is an extraordinary challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's a transition that has never happened in economic history. So it's a very, very big <coughs> ask. Um, what, what has what's happened this year done for that? Well, in the short term, it's made it more difficult. Um, it has put a lot of pressure on, on people. It's distracted attention, quite rightly, on these very urgent, immediate problems. Um, it's driven up what were already high hydrocarbon prices. In Europe in particular, it's likely to, um, if not postpone coal phase out, it's likely at least to increase the utilization of coal assets in, in, as a way of avoiding burning gas. That's the short-term picture. The medium-term picture for the EBRD region, we're quite clear, will accelerate the transition. And it's done that because it's brought home, uh, we've been saying for years something that the, 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 there is now a perfect alignment when it comes to the energy sector of price, energy security, st energy price stability, and pol politics. And we've been saying that for several years. We've been saying for years, look, it's a no-brainer. Move to renewables. Renewables are secure. Renewables are cheap. Renewables are your, on your territory. And we haven't always been listened to. But right now, it's very, very obvious. So I think that what you'll see in the next few years is, and you'll see this already coming out of the Commission, and the, and, and the European Commission is really the driver of so much energy policy, not just for the European Union, but also for the neighborhood. Um, you see that there's this very strong emphasis on more renewables and electrification. Electrification of heat, electrification of transport, and generating that electricity from, from renewable energy. So I expect that we will see that very strongly in the coming years. Um, turning to what can EBRD do, and you mentioned de-risking. Well, what we can do is we have a hierarchy of interventions, and I'll take them in order of, of, of importance. The first and most important of all is to work with governments to set a very clear message. At the end of the day, all economic actors respond to the messages set by the regulatory policy framework. And so that regulatory policy framework has to embed the fact that we are going as fast as we can to a zero carbon energy system. And so the first thing we, would, we always ask a government that we're working with to talk about is a net zero target. You can set a net zero target for 2050, but in some cases, countries have said we want longer. We want 2060, or even in the case of India, 2070. But what really, really matters is that the very clear message comes politically that the economy is, and the energy sector is heading for zero emissions. When you've got that, you can then start to talk about a trajectory to that end point. And the, other, the next thing we think is really, really important, and where we work with governments, is to set an, a renewable energy strategy. 
People often talk about how they want their countries to benefit from a, re from a renewable energy boom. Morocco is a classic example of a country which has invested very heavily in renewable energy, not just to transform its energy sector, but also to transform its manufacturing sector, to create economic opportunity, to create jobs for people. The single best way to do that is to put a really big ambition on the table. So we, what we always recommend with governments and try to work with governments is to say, set a target. Set a target that's expressed in gigawatts and years, not we're going to do a 200 megawatt project this year and maybe another 500 megawatts next year and then we'll see. But let's be bold, let's be ambitious. Let's say it's 10 gigawatts in 10 years or it's 10 gigawatts in five years. If you do that, not only do you stimulate a lot of renewable investment, not only do you accelerate the transition, but you also send a very strong signal to manufacturers that this is a country worth investing in, this is a country worth training people in, this is a country you want to build your next factory. But that, for us, is the most important step. The next step after the high-level ambition is the detail of the implementation. And from there, what we really advise and where we provide a lot of support for governments is to use competitive tendering mechanisms. Morocco, again, is a great example of a country that has used these mechanisms to develop, in particular, the NOAA projects. And what you see is that with an open, transparent, competitive international tender, you will get very, very competitive prices. But there are a lot of other steps that need to be in place. You need the right grid code. You need the right um, permitting regime. You need people to be able to step through all of the hoops required to build these big infrastructure projects without taking 10 years, without having an unpredictable outcome. So those are key implementation steps. I haven't mentioned finance yet, despite the fact that we're a bank, but that comes next. What we will do is we will provide finance for projects. Now that finances projects in themselves, but for us, what's really important is not just that we finance a project, but that we bring others with us. Because at the end of the day, the capital that we can deploy is not nearly enough for the transition. We need lots of other people in the room, and above all, we need institutional, private capital. So when we're providing finance, we're doing that not just to make a project happen, but also to give comfort to other lenders, to catalyze other interests. So those are the three main things we do. We try to help a government set a high-level ambition. We try to work on the detail of implementation. We provide our own finance. And the fourth thing, probably the last and, and, uh, and the, the least important of all of this, is that from time to time we will use specific structures to de-risk certain risks. But I've left that to last because it's, it can be important to catalyze some specific technologies, some specific investments, but it's the least important thing. What matters most of all is an ambition, and the detail to make that ambition a reality. And that's where, for us, our key role is in making that happen. Thank you so much, Harry. Really interesting to hear that you really think that, the, that this latest crisis will accelerate the energy transition and all the different things that EBRD can do. Next, I want to turn to Iskander. Iskander Azini Vernois, um, uh, an independent Moroccan climate expert um, who's in the process of setting up a new climate change think tank here in Morocco with an African, Arab, and Mediterranean perspective on this global challenge. You have a lot of experience in climate diplomacy and negotiations having worked on COP22, the COP, the, the UNFCCC, the big climate conference that was held here in, in Morocco in 20, when was 16. It? 2016, and, um, uh, and have a background uh, from London School of Economics, from Yale, and used to work for E3G. So, um, Iskander, really interesting to hear from you what you think the role of civil society organizations like yours is in the energy transition and what the perspective is from here in Morocco in terms of the global energy transition and also the issue around the gas price crisis. Iskander, over to you, five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Sonia. So I'll address myself, I think, uh, in the first instance to the role of the civil society uh, in the energy transition uh, and then hope to get to some of the uh, more substantive matters around uh, energy uh, in the discussion. Uh, but I want to start uh, by way of introduction uh, by recalling, indeed, the, the fact that the last time I was here was in, in this building was in the sort of pre-sessional uh, preparations for, for COP22 in 2016. And, and then uh, I was in government, so I was not in uh, this civil society role. Um, but, but here I am on the other side of the table. Uh, and I think it's, it's interesting to observe that of the, the different... Uh, NGO uh, representatives here, at least um, on the panel, uh, physically present, um, 
the, the three of us coming from think tank backgrounds also have worked, uh, all of us in, in, uh, in our respective governments, uh, and yet have chosen to, to, to work in, in civil society. And I think there's a, an important question to ask there of, of why, why we've, we've chosen to, to do that. Um, and by way of explanation uh, in that regard, uh, I want to take us back even further in time, uh, still remaining in this building, but going back uh, over 20 uh, years, so that would be over 15 years to uh, uh, COP22 in, in, in 2016, back to the early 2000s when COP7 uh, was held, as many people in this room might know, uh, in Marrakesh. What not everyone in this room might know is that it was held actually in this uh, very building. And that speaks uh, to the fact that the international climate pr process has grown massively. There's no way you could fit a COP inside uh, a building uh, like this these days. Um, but it, it gives you, uh, I think, uh, reason, all of us, cause to pause and reflect, because it's been 20 years. That was COP7, you know, in Marrakesh. We're now approaching COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh this year in, in Egypt. And I think civil society has a fundamental role to play in asking ourselves big, quick, big picture questions like, what have we achieved in the past 20 years? And is it sufficient? And I think clearly from the standpoint of the, um, the United Nations uh, international climate process, the answer is no. The objective uh, that the UN process sets is to avoid dangerous runaway climate change uh, in the Earth system. Um, and currently, per the latest reports from the IPCC, uh, we're on, on track as a world for a trajectory of over two degrees Celsius. Uh, and the IPCC also tells us that for this part of the world, in particular, as a climate change hotspot, uh, that's going to mean a uh, increase in the frequency and a doubling uh, in the duration of, uh, of droughts in North Africa and the Sahel. So I think as uh, civil society globally, but also locally, we have to bear in mind these existential risks. Uh, these, uh, this energy transition is nothing that we can prevaricate around. And I think, quite frankly, uh, the, the lack of progress uh, that we've seen uh, in the past 20 years uh, does represent something of a strategic and moral failure. I think we have to uh, agree uh, so I think the civil society has uh, an important role to play in exercising uh, both a moral and a strategic voice. Uh, but there's also a third voice that I think uh, it can exercise, and I'll say a few words uh, on that, and that's the technical voice. Um, and I think that that's obviously well represented on this panel with uh, civil society representatives that have done a lot of, of technical uh, work and I think technical work is, is is hugely important. I've been witness to various public policy processes where the right uh, technical research at the right time uh, really transforms uh, outcomes. Yeah, even in you know well-resourced uh, government and MDB processes that you'd think were, were doing just fine in terms of technical capacity. Um, but I think it's particularly important in a part of the world like uh, uh, North Africa where we don't have the uh, uh, immense government capacities that uh, that you might have in in London in terms of uh, you know government analytical uh, capabilities and and so on, so it becomes particularly important in that context and particularly important in the context of uh, uh, major uh, infrastructure finance uh, when we're looking for uh, uh, things like uh, risks and opportunities uh, that may be financial in nature, uh, maybe related to energy, maybe to technology, climate or socio-environmental, and civil society, I think, has a fundamental role to play there, and I think some of us were witness to this earlier today, but, but in many instances, that there's a, 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 a fundamental role for civil society to play in that, in that regard. Um, and I think that it's especially important, as folks have, have talked about over the, the past few days, when you look at uh, a part of the world like this, where there's a lot of fiscal vulnerabilities, quite frankly, you know, we can't, be af we can't afford to make uh, misguided uh, infrastructure decisions that overlook some of the, uh, the financial risks associated with, with some of these uh, choices that we're talking about in the energy transition. So I hope, hope to get uh, to that in a bit more detail in the discussion, um, and also the opportunity space, which is massive, as we all know, 
and the role of civil society in, in, in sort of pressing and asking uh, why it is that we're not pursuing all of these uh, you know, great opportunities out there and what can be done. So a strategic, moral, and, and technical voice, I think, is important for civil society. And so I'll <clears throat> just to uh, wrap up, I think uh, that where I would leave it is to say that I think that you know, if we look at the, the overall framing for this event uh, of the annual meetings around responding to challenges in, in turbulent times, I think we can do so successfully and in a just way uh, when we in engage civil society in all of its diversity. And to just explain what I mean by that, um, the, I think one thing that has to be mentioned is that civil society has to be engaged in a way that's reflective of society. We have to avoid things like male-dominated panels, especially in this day and age of 2022. I had to mention that. Uh, but especially when we have so much uh, uh, talent in the, in the region, uh, female talent in the way of uh, expertise in so many areas that are germane uh, to civil society in the energy transition. And then I think... Um, Thank you. Yes, so the, the final two things um, in that regard, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the, the sort of um, diversity of civil society, just to acknowledge that we're all think tanks, and we, we need to make sure that the grassroots and other campaigning NGOs are in the room as well. And then last but not least, uh, geographic diversity, we have to ensure that the civil society community from the uh, Global South is, is fully represented Great. as well. I suggest we leave it there, we come back to that, because that was really interesting to hear how this building is steeped in the history of climate change and energy transition and, and the different kinds of voices civil society can have. But I want to now, if the technical gods will smile on us, um, bring in Yosef Ben Mir, who is our uh, virtual participant here in this panel today. Um, he is the founder and president of the High Atlas Foundation, which is a Morocco-American, uh, Morocco-US, not-for-profit foundation working on sustainable development. Um, Youssef is also a professor at the University of Virginia with a lot of many academic qualifications and is somewhere in Morocco, although I confess I don't know where. So Youssef, you should tell us where you are in Morocco because I know you're on the ground delivering sustainable development in the field, doing the real deal. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective from uh, on the ground, but also how you think this country can at a community level achieve that 100% renewables target. Yosef, over to you, five minutes. Thank you, and my appreciation to everyone there. I'm actually speaking to you from Cyprus. Uh, I'm part of a group that is making an appeal to investors to invest in W4F. W4F is the sponsor, but it's also our strategy to help communities achieve their dreams. And that's really essentially uh, the approach I'd like to pre present uh, the energy transition. We begin at the Hyatt Foundation, and I think it's rooted in development experience going back generations. We begin with community participation. What it is that people want uh, at, as we collectively, uh, as members of a community search hearts, uh, what is the future that reflects the way that locality wants to develop and grow? What we have found uh, over the 20 years of our work is that participation doesn't necessarily guarantee that the action plan that emerges from that community interaction, that, that action plan that does, does not automatically mean that it reflects the heart of the participants when we don't feel ourselves free, when we, we feel inhibited, when we're not uh, feeling the confidence and the belief and the sense of the future that we would like to create. And so we now precede uh, community planning with empowerment. We launched this process with a four day um, personal and collective uh, exploration experience. And when we go through that process of analyzing the social relationships in our lives, the relationships that help us, but also uh, oftentimes may hold us back, our relationship to work and money and spirituality um, all the, these major facets of, of living and then go into community planning, we have found that the results that that action plan more directly reflects the will of the community of the participants. And that action plan of projects, therein lies the opportunity to integrate renewable energy. 
in Morocco, in rural Morocco, there's a great transition from uh, growing barley and corn, which is on 70% of agricultural land, yet only generates 10 to 15% of agricultural revenue. There's this great transition to fruit tree agriculture and medicinal plants and building community-based nurseries uh, in, from seed to sapling and then transplanting. And that requires, of course, um, water infrastructure, uh, capacity building, greenhouses, uh, technical training, managerial, uh, how to create a cooperative, how to build a financial management system of that cooperative, how to open a bank account. I mean, it comes down to those essentials. And so the integration of renewable energy is within a broader community development process and experience. And thankfully in Morocco, the, the participatory approach is embodied in national charters, in the National Initiative for Human Development, in, in the decentralization roadmap. And that's essential to uh, remember. Decentralization is in Article One of the Constitution. It's a progressive uh, model that Morocco has fashioned for itself. It it has the national level remain engaged and contributive to achieve the priorities of lo the localities. And it, furthermore, within that roadmap, it involves public-private partnership. And there too, to help enable the projects of the people to be implemented. Our challenge is that we need, uh, it, it, I'll say it, in, it, the challenges are twofold. Number one, it, it, communities don't spontaneously come together and plan the future that is most important to them. It requires facilitation. And uh, we work with university students and teachers and others to be that catalyst, that facilitator of local dialogue. The other component, which I'd like to mention and perhaps relevant to the important points that our, our panelists have said, is the implementation of that action plan. Oftentimes when we think about renewable energy, well, let's fund the solar water pump. Well, what about the seeds that we need to irrigate and the greenhouses? We should see the energy transition as beyond the infrastructure and training for that energy component. We should fund the whole of the project. In, in Marrakesh is a region, as well as an incredible, uh, vastly uh, rich and historic city. In the region of Marrakesh, the province of El Hauz, of which, it's, of which is part, they're approaching 100 schools without bathrooms. Can we build the bathrooms and, in addition, integrate the energy transition to pump the water? And so that would be our, our message that the, the decentralization context of Morocco allows for community planning to flourish. We have capacity building support in our case, but and, and, and fun, to fund the experiential learning and training, our challenge always comes down to the infrastructure. Can we, can we build the project as a whole in addition to the renewable energy components? And with the, my final thought will be on the matter of urgency. Yes, there's obvious and overwhelming ur uh, urgency in relation to energy, but I will say that there are girls not going to school every day in Morocco because they're fetching water. And that energy transition to pump water would, would assist that. And I would suggest that the, the pain and, and the urgency in relation to the consequence of rural poverty, um, which is assisted and, and overcome with energy transition, but we need more than that. We need the entirety of the, of the solution of the project to be implemented. And, uh, and I'm grateful you. to be able to share that thought with you. Brilliant. Thank you, Yosef. And so interesting to hear about how important it is to involve local communities to make this a success. Um, je vais maintenant changer au français. Donc, si vous parlez pas français, mettez votre uh, interprétation, écoutez uh, dans les écouteurs, parce que je vais maintenant introduire notre dernier speaker, uh, Monsieur Hazon Agouzoul, um, qui est uh, conseiller à l'Alliance marocaine sur le climat et le développement durable, uh, qui est uh, directeur du SDG Action Strategy Center sur les 
des objectifs du développement durable des Nations Unies, qui est ingénieur et qui va donc nous, nous, nous expliquer les, qui, qui a un, un, du, du point de vue technique euh, de la transition énergétique et qui est vraiment spécialiste non seulement sur les renouvelables, mais aussi sur l'efficacité énergétique. Donc, Hassan, ça serait vraiment intéressant de savoir votre perspective sur le rôle de la société civile dans la transition énergétique et aussi et les, les, le rôle aussi des organisations non gouvernementales et aussi de comment euh, est-ce qu'on peut être sûr que cette transition sera vraiment juste, une transition juste ici au Maroc et euh, partout dans le monde arabe et d'ailleurs tout, dans toute la région de la Berbe. Donc Hassan, cinq minutes, ça serait vraiment intéressant de savoir votre point de vue. Merci. 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 Euh, merci Sonia pour, pour l'introduction. Euh, merci aux collègues euh, et Youssef également. Euh, moi, je suis... Euh, conseiller principal de l'Alliance marocaine pour le climat et le développement durable. C'est un, une plateforme de référence au Maroc euh, des ONG environnementales. Il regroupe plus de 1000 ONG au niveau national et territorial. Il est euh, structuré en sept commissions thématiques nationales et 12 bureaux de coordination territoriale. Il a comme principale mission, c'est de contribuer de manière forte avec euh, des propositions concrètes à la, au processus de prise de décision au niveau national et au niveau de, décentralisé, c'est-à-dire au niveau des régions et des villes et des communes. Euh, cette mission stratégique allouée à la société civile par la Constitution du Maroc euh, a été donc transformée, transcrite, dans le cadre de cette plateforme nationale de référence euh, pour sous forme de deux missions. La première, c'est le dialogue inter entre les ONG environnementales pour pouvoir débattre et, et identifier et construire des analyses communes et des diagnostics communs et des idées communes. La deuxième mission stratégique de l'Alliance marocaine pour le climat et le développement durable, c'est le plaidoyer. Un plaidoyer, là aussi, c'est un métier spécial qui demande beaucoup de professionnalisme, beaucoup de sciences et techniques et également beaucoup de stratégies de lobbying et d'influence auprès des décideurs, auprès de l'exécutif, du Parlement et des autorités au niveau également euh, territorial. Euh, je profite de, de cette occasion également pour euh, féliciter euh, Libert d'avoir eu le prix mondial du de, euh, de financement du commerce durable. Je pense que pour moi, la, le commerce durable, c'est le moyen le plus stratégique pour pouvoir influencer les flux des matières et les flux euh, euh, d'échanges et des chaînes d'approvisionnement et des chaînes de valeur au niveau international et interrégional. Et euh, donc, pour moi, c'est le meilleur moyen que, pour que les MDBs contribuent à la décarbonation de l'économie mondiale. Je vais essayer de profiter de ce temps imparti pour focuser sur, trois, sur cinq messages clés. Que la société civile, l'Alliance marocaine pour le climat et le développement durable, a rédigé dans un livre blanc qu'il a soumis au gouvernement au mois d'octobre 2021, suite aux élections législatives qui ont eu lieu et lui ont été transmises. Donc, c'est un travail qui a duré trois mois en parallèle avec les élections. Et donc le document final a permis donc de donner au gouvernement des orientations claires pour l'alignement de l'ensemble des politiques publiques et du programme gouvernemental avec les exigences de l'accord de Paris et les 17 SDGs de l'agenda 2030 et pour que le programme gouvernemental pour les cinq prochaines années soit un programme qui vise la transition verte, juste et résiliente. Ces cinq messages consiste au premier à l'urgence d'agir maintenant, durant ces prochaines années, et notamment les trois prochaines années, avant que l'objectif 1,5 ne soit plus à notre portée, comme a été bien analysé dans le dernier rapport de IPCC qui a été publié début avril 2022 concernant les solutions de, 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 de mitigation. Le deuxième message important, c'est le besoin de prendre en compte 
la différenciation entre les deux modèles de transition énergétique, ceux des pays industrialisés, fortement fossiles et fortement carbonés, et ceux des pays en voie de développement qui ont leurs besoins en termes d'infrastructures de, de croissance et de réduction des inégalités et d'accès à une électricité compétitive et pas chère. Le troisième message important, c'est l'importance d'assurer une synergie, un équilibre entre les politiques publiques d'adaptation, qui sont le besoin crucial de survie des pays du Sud fortement exposés aux effets extrêmes des changements climatiques, notamment les inondations et la sécheresse aiguë et la sécurité alimentaire, et la deuxième dimension de la résilience face à ces chocs climatiques, et la troisième on va dire politique publique de décarbonation. Donc, l'effort investi par l'État, par le secteur privé, doit être équilibré entre ces trois dimensions pour ne pas favoriser seulement la décarbonation au détriment de la survie, de la soutenabilité du modèle économique national. Le quatrième message stratégique, c'est que l'approche de transition vers cette économie verte, vers cette ce développement durable et décarboné doit absolument adopter une approche sociétale, démocratique, globale, pour assurer une soutenabilité, un engagement fort de l'ensemble des composantes de la société et assurer également, comme vous l'avez demandé, une transition juste, une transition basée sur une répartition équitable, juste, des bénéfices de cette transition, de ses avantages en matière sociale, économique, emploi et accès à un niveau de vie, à un revenu digne et décent, et pour également que les coûts de cette transition soient des coûts optimisés, réfléchis, répartis entre les secteurs publics et les secteurs privés. Le dernier message important pour moi, c'est que tout le monde a insisté sur l'implémentation. Il ne suffit pas d'avoir des tracés, des visions, des objectifs ambitieux. Et il faut également travailler sur l'implémentation. Sauf que l'implémentation d'une transformation majeure souhaitée par le net zéro ou par les politiques d'adaptation, qui se caractérise par des échéances moyen et long terme, nécessite beaucoup de souffle et nécessite également que la conduite de changement soit structurée, maîtrisée, et pas seulement liée à des mandats de court terme décidés par des politiciens qui changent au cours de route, de chemin ou des enjeux. Et donc, la logique de continuité de l'effort nécessite une stratégie de conduite de changement euh, qui permet euh, euh, notamment une implémentation soutenable et sereine des feuilles de route, et notamment celle de la stratégie de développement bas carbone à l'horizon 2050 et celle également liée à la transformation du secteur financier public et privé pour l'aligner avec ses nouveaux objectifs de net zéro et de résilience. Il nécessitera également une gouvernance, une gouvernance adaptée sous forme de multi-échelle, multi c'est-à-dire au niveau interministériel, au niveau territorial, au niveau local, et également multi-acteurs et multi-secteurs, avec des jalons moyens et long terme, et qui viseraient, ou plutôt se baseraient, sur un nouveau mindset pour le développement des villes, de notre mode d'alimentation et de notre aménagement territorial au niveau régional. Merci, voilà. Merci beaucoup. Je vais revenir sur beaucoup de ces points-là. I'm going to switch back to English now, so you can take your um, uh, uh, headsets off. Um, uh, because we've got some questions. We've got time for some questions from the audience now. So if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up. Brilliant. I'm going to prioritize uh, women because we do have a panel of all gentlemen. So uh, we have some questions coming in on Slido, so you can also s uh, ask questions that way as well. But, Madam, yes, in the blue, in the blue blazer, can you please ask your question? Say who you are, your name, and where you're from as well. 
Thank you. I'm uh, Nadia Hmeiti, uh, President of Association La Siesta for the Protection of the Environment, a grassroots association, and founder of the Think Tank, another think tank uh, that works on uh, the just transition, um, uh, clean and participat participative uh, transition. As a grassroots uh, organization, and I think Iskandar for mentioning that, uh, we are trying to make all uh, the people sit together to find solutions and to bring uh, real alternatives that will t uh, take uh, in consideration the social, the uh, technical, and uh, all the aspects and the political aspects. Actually, uh, we are working with uh, politicals, with elected and the representative of people, and uh, with the uh, civil society, and with the public sec sector and private sector and academics. So our think tank makes it all these people together in focus groups, and we are uh, preparing uh, studies that will be um, uh, proposed to the government. So, and we have, the ne our next meeting will be at the parliament. So what I wanted to say is that uh, as a civil, uh, as an activist, actually I'm, I consider myself uh, as an activist more than an NGO, because uh, the environment is my passion and protecting it also. So um, at the uh, first time I met uh, public uh, uh, people from the private sector, I was like, whoa, the polluters are here. <laughs> but now the solutions are coming from private sectors and making sit uh, the, the, the academics with private sector, uh, they, uh, they are finding solutions together because they-, they So your question is maybe how we can do that more? Or? The question uh, is, well, actually it's more a request than a question okay. because grassroots organizations do not have access to media like uh, big uh, organizations. So maybe mm, uh, it's for media and to, to make our uh, actions visible. Um, it, you, we are financed by the European Climate Foundation. It's the only organization that has believed in our actions. So if you Fantastic. want solutions that come from people to people, please make us more visible. We are doing our best and help us. Well, this is, that's part of what this event is about. Does anyone else in the room, especially any women, have any questions they want to put to the panel? We have someone there, hand up in the middle there. Thank you. And we'll come back to your question, Nadia. So it's really about how to bring academics and, and, and civil society together to bring that just transition. Yosef, I think you would be fantastic to answer that. Um, Thank you. Go uh, ahead, yes. Yeah. Please tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Margot Day, and I'm the policy director of Accountability Council. Um, local communities living near and working at investment sites are often the first to know if an investment is off track. So they will know if money for sustainable projects is missing its mark. So my, and indeed, 52% of registered complaints to the EBRD's accountability mechanisms over time have alleged harm to the environment. So my question is, how have the panelists seen investors learn lessons from complaints to accountability mechanisms? And also, in what ways have panelists seen investors successfully include local communities' voices in the design of sustainable projects in the first place? Thank you. Fantastic, and I think it'll be interesting to get Harry's answer to that and also Yosef. Uh, I think we have one more question there. Let's take one more question, then try and get some answers. So, uh, gentlemen in the middle there, yeah, thank you. Merci bien. Euh, Madame, euh, lors de votre introduction, vous avez posé une euh, très bonne question concernant les gaz de naturel. Malheureusement, les panélistes n'ont pas eu le temps de répondre, <rire> <rire> vu le temps. Euh, pour moi, le gaz naturel, il y en a deux. Il y a les gaz naturels qui sont conventionnels, qui sont produits au Moyen-Orient, en Russie, et les gaz naturels non conventionnels. Et là, il faut faire attention. Si les gaz naturels conventionnels sont un peu moins polluants, les gaz naturels non conventionnels, qui sont les gaz de schiste, c'est très grave pour l'environnement. Ils ont des impacts désastreux et vraiment, il faut se méfier. Et à cause de la guerre actuellement en Ukraine, les pays européens ils ont tendance à encourager l'importation des gaz des États-Unis. Oui. Et les gaz des États-Unis sont des gaz de schiste. C'est comme s'ils vont encourager la destruction de notre environnement sur la planète. 
Merci pour la, la question. D'accord. Et donc, la question, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire avec ça Quel est votre nom et votre organisation Alors, mon nom, c'est Benata Mohamed. Je préside une ONG, l'Espace de solidarité et de coopération orientale. Et je coordonne aussi un collectif qui est l'Ecoloman, l'Ecoloplateforme du Maroc du Nord. Et je suis membre aussi de la coalition Arabotch. Arab Merci. Fabuleux. Um, so I, we've got, I, we haven't got very much time now. I, presume, I, I propose we take one more question from the back there, from the lady at the back, and then we'll try and get some answers. So we've got a question around just transition, around the complaints process at EBRD, around gas, and one more question there. And then we have a question online that's coming online as well about an example of an EBRD project that helps reduce dependence on Russian gas. So a specific example. Yeah. Madam, please tell us your name and, and where you're from. Sure, Kenza, I'm from Marrakech and I work with Association Zero Zbel, which is the Zero Waste Association here. And I have a very specific question for Dr. Youssef. Um, I know that you get funds from big corporations and I believe L'Oreal might be one of them. I'm wondering is when you do so, is there, um, can you influence them? For example, since I work in waste, our biggest problem is packaging. So do, does your organization or other organizations, for example, try to influence their funders in such a way? Okay, so influencing funders of CSOs, interesting one. Yosef, I suggest we come to you first. So I'd like you to talk about the just transition question and how you see that in your community work and also the question on funding. And then I might go to Harry for the complaints and the gas. Um, Yosef, over to you. Um, all very important points. Um, let me just say this. When we begin a community planning process, we, have, we don't say agriculture or culture or health or energy transition. There are no boundaries. It has to emerge from how people feel and think. And our role is really just to assist the process that allows for that kind of discovery and exchange change and consensus and formulation and it's filled with trial and joy and conflict and ultimately an action plan and facilitation is key to ensure an inclusive uh, positive result uh, the sharing of information and so forth and so when projects are able to have genuinely emerge from that it's a key element of sustainability But it, the energy to do that, the energy to be with their people where they are, wherever they may be, and not give up and go through this, you know, many weeks and months, that's why the Highest Foundation, whatever good we've done, we've dedicated to that kind of process. And when we're talking about the first speaker, talking about the, the think tank, what we learn through that community dialogue ultimately to implementation of projects, we learn policy reform. I could not imagine developing a policy based on research or any removal from the community experience. We learn about Moroccan laws and, and land ownership. By talking to the community, all, right? All the different things. And so if we want to develop policy, they'll, they'll more accurately emerge from the people's experience. And we'll get media around it. We, we receive plenty of media at the Highless Foundation. We're never asking for it, but we receive it because the projects, when they open, it involves government and civil society and private sector and multiple levels. And there you get the attention and the policy and what it is that we need. And to the last question. Yeah, on, um, on, on funding. This, um, Yves Saint Laurent Butte, the first time they sourced local product, flowers, Um, leaves, what they need to create their product is from a cooperative that took us six years to work in the kind of process I just described to you. From hello, meaning the, these, the women came from multiple villages, salam alaikum, they met, they went through the kinds of training and planning and action and now literacy funded by the EU and, and a garden that Uh, grows the flowers and, and so forth and dries them and exports them to Yves Saint Laurent Butte. And I, and I will say that I believe it's one of the first times, it may be the first time or among the very first times that they source directly from the growers. Right. And, Thank and you.
You said, but I so think I, we'll I, leave it there because we've got go many ahead, more go people ahead, to, ahead, to, 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 to squeeze in. So Harry, Harry Boyd Carpenter from EBRD, a couple of questions for you. So one there, on, a specific question on the complaints procedure that from the audience. We've also had um, uh, a question come in online in terms of a specific, an example of a project that's ha helped to reduce energy dependence on Russia. Can you address those two questions and then we'll probably come to the others for the other ones. Harry, over to you. Well, I'll take the last one. The, the, the question of, you know, which projects reduce dependence on Russian gas? I mean, pretty much most of them, if not all. Um, but I'd say most the obvious thing, we've, we've financed 10 gigawatts of renewable capacity over the last, over the last uh, 10 years, much of which has been in Europe. And, you know, every megawatt hour that you generate from a wind turbine and a solar panel is a megawatt hour you didn't have to burn anybody's gas for. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't need to sort of cast around for specific projects. On the question of, our, of how local engagement works, I'll say generally it's critical, and, and especially when you look at the volume of renewable energy that needs to be, uh, to be generated and the number of projects that need to happen, you need to find ways of bringing, you, you have to have the local buy-in. I mean, I've seen projects that haven't worked because, or have struggled because of a failure to do that, and I've thankfully seen more projects that have worked. But how we handle that, how that works, in the spirit of diluting the un unhappy gender balance, I'm going to ask my colleague Maya Henekes, who's an environment and social expert, to, to, to talk a bit more. Can we get a microphone to Maya, please, in the, in the floor here? Thank you. Thank you so much. Because we are indeed, we have a panel of all gentlemen, and I hope by the time we get to next year and we do this again, there'll be more women. But Maya, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, is this on? Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, now, um, absolutely agree with Harry. We take it very seriously, and in fact, our environmental social policy mandates us. We have a performance requirement 10, which lays us very clearly that we need and we want to um, engage with all stakeholders that in absolutely includes local communities. So we, um, we always have engagement processes that go in many times beyond the requirements of national legislation. We um, especially do those, of course, in those large-scale kind of renewable projects, for example, that would constitute Category A projects. We look at it very carefully, and it's the right thing to do, but it also makes total business sense because that really is what gives then the project the license to operate. So we cannot... Um, any, at any point, you know, overlook this. It's very but important it, to have buy-in. But buy it's, in. it's really important to really listen to the local communities and not just go through the, the processes as well. That, that's why stakeholder engagement is a two-way street. We can, it's not an information session to tell people what's going to look like. Exactly. It is really a two-way street to understand what the needs are, what the, um, you know, what the concerns are, and then try and build that in as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. So um, next, I want to address some of the questions that are coming in online. One of them is, given with this current crisis, does EBRD need a recapitalization? Does EBRD need more funding in order to do what it needs to do? Iskandar, I'd be interested in your perspective on that and also in uh, anything more you want to say about how you think EBRD can help um, uh, some of the EBRD countries of operation that are ex importing a lot of energy. Iskandar, over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> just checking the mic is on. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really important question because obviously it's about the, the political economy of, of global finance and its availability um, and, you know, the, the, um, the existence of opportunity to be able to uh, ensure that the, the climate transition is, is possible, both in terms of uh, resilience and uh, mitigation, to, to all countries. Um, and I think as observers of the international uh, situation are seeing, we're seeing uh, the large donor countries in the G7 prioritize some of the biggest em emitters uh, among countries. So there was a deal concluded with South Africa. Uh, deals are currently being pursued with some of the Southeast Asian economies. And so then I think there, there comes a question, what about countries uh, in North Africa are we going to be penalized for not being as big polluters, for not having all of this coal? And I think, you know, in an ideal world and as a matter of justice for civil society, the answer uh, should be no, and we should campaign for uh, the funds to be made available uh, as a matter of uh, climate finance and uh, the responsibility uh, of uh, developed countries to developing countries uh, to, to try to accelerate the transition in, in countries like Morocco and to address the, the second part of your question just briefly. I mean, I think Morocco is an example of another country uh, who 
uh, as a country that hasn't been an exporter of fossil fuels, it has, it, it has uh, recently uh, experienced uh, issues uh, relating to geopolitics with its supply of gas. Um, and, and so I think if, if this underscores anything, it's the importance of, of moving away from gas as, as soon as possible. Uh, and indeed from all uh, fossil-fired uh, power generation, which has high operating costs and is not good for industrial competitiveness. Thank you, Iskander. And now I'd like to come to Hassan um, uh, through the interpretation, because um, uh, I'm interested in understanding how what you think EBRD can be doing more to help countries like Morocco that are importing many of their energy needs, and also in terms of the financial intermediaries and the, 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 uh, the, the banks that are operating in Morocco, do you see enough transparency in terms of what they're doing on climate change? Hassan, over to you. Merci. Merci, merci Sonia. Euh, par rapport à, à l'accès des entreprises euh, marocaines euh, à la finance durable ou à la finance climat, aujourd'hui, la problématique se, fo, se pose au niveau de trois paramètres. D'abord, il y a, euh, concernant le secteur, on va dire, euh, du financement des projets énergétiques. Il se pose à trois niveaux. Le premier, c'est au niveau de la régulation, de la réglementation. Il y a besoin d'achever le cadre législatif et réglementaire euh, d'investissement euh, dans les projets d'énergie renouvelable et d'efficacité énergétique pour aborder ce grand créneau de décentralisation, d'équipement au niveau euh, domestique, au niveau des usines, au niveau des ménages, au niveau des bâtiments, et tout ce qui est installation d'efficacité énergétique et renouvelable. Ce cadre réglementaire, il a bien avancé. Nous, aujourd'hui, on a atteint un niveau de demande de besoins de criticité qui nécessitent que euh, l'accès à la basse tension et à la moyenne tension pour les petits projets et les moyens projets soit réglementé. Aujourd'hui, il y a deux grands projets de loi euh, qui sont au Parlement, aujourd'hui, en discussion. Le premier concerne justement euh, le cadrage de toute le, 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 la, la libération du marché d'électricité renouvelable pour les industriels pour accéder à la moyenne tension. Euh, et le deuxième projet de loi concerne le projet de l'autoproduction, l'autoconsommation au niveau in situ. Ces deux projets, justement, vont donner un minimum de garantie d'un marché libre, concurrentiel, compétitif pour une énergie, euh, euh, on va dire, moins chère et fiable. Euh, le deuxième euh, niveau de, de, on va dire, euh, clé ou critique pour que le, le marché soit libre, libre et, et concurrentiel, ou plutôt accessible, c'est au niveau du secteur financier privé, local, qui doit se doter des stratégies internes dans leur politique d'investissement, dans leur politique de prise en compte des risques climatiques, pour justement faire de la finance durable et de la finance climat et des investissements verts des priorités, des priorités au niveau local. Et monter en puissance en termes de mobilisation de la finance privée euh, nationale pour euh, euh, compenser l'effort prédominant de la finance publique aujourd'hui qui subit toute la pression de les, et des moyens nécessaires pour réussir cette transition vers... Parce Donc, que a... la finance publique ne peut pas faire tout. Parce que la finance ne peut pas faire tout. Ouais. Et aujourd'hui, au Maroc, si on se limite au cas du Maroc, aujourd'hui, nous avons une nouvelle charte nationale d'investissement oui. qui a fixé comme un grand objectif que la finance privée représente les deux tiers de, des financements mobilisés au niveau national et que le public soit réduit à seulement un tiers. Pour cela, il y a tout un, un plan d'action extrêmement ambitieux et qui nécessite justement que euh, tous les acteurs soient mobilisés et que quelqu'un soit là pour euh, regardant et c'est la société civile qui peut faire toujours l'alerte et la larme. Troisième niveau, pour répondre à votre question, c'est au niveau de la demande. Au niveau de la demande, aujourd'hui, au niveau de l'économie réelle, il y a un grand besoin de monter un pipeline de projets bancables et éligibles aux critères et aux procédures de la finance climat et de la finance durable. À ce niveau-là, je pense que le marché est prêt. L'expertise commence à se développer au niveau des bureaux d'études spécialisés avec l'appui de l'expertise internationale 
Et aujourd'hui, il faut attaquer donc, les, les grands morceaux, les 80%, c'est-à-dire les zones industrielles, et en faire un référentiel compact de zones industrielles intégrées, décarbonées et économes en ressources naturelles, notamment l'eau et notamment la dépollution des rejets solides et liquides et gaz. Et c'est là que la BERD, la IBRD peut être Effectivement. Effectivement. We're, we're nearly out of time. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to ask a question quickly? Any, any? Yes, we have someone in the middle there. Could we get a microphone just to squeeze in a few more questions just to, to yeah. Please go ahead. Tell us your name and your organization. Je suis de Rabat et je travaille au ministère de l'économie et des finances. Euh, tout à l'heure, vous l'avez dit, madame, euh, donc, euh, les crises internationales et nous ramènent à changer les calculs. Et donc, euh, je me reconnais euh, la position de représentant de la banque par rapport à l'impact qu'auraient ces crises sur les engagements de l'Union européenne, notamment dans le Green Deal et aussi dans le CEBAM, le mécanisme d'ajustement euh, carbone aux frontières. Ça, c'est la première question. La deuxième, euh, je me dis que pendant le Covid, euh, on a pu raccourcir le temps pour inventer, on va fabriquer des vaccins. Qu'est-ce qu'il faudra faire pour raccourcir le temps de la transition énergétique Et s'il te plaît, pas... Les instruments financiers, on les connaît. Ils sont les plus difficiles parce que, dans, comme l'a dit M. Hassan tout à l'heure, euh, il faut garder et préserver le modèle économique. Et donc, on les connaît. Et dans des économies fragiles, c'est toujours difficile. On, on a d'autres euh, solutions euh, financières qui sont beaucoup acceptées, on va dire. Mais euh, je, je pense plutôt envers euh, euh, la communauté scientifique, on va dire, pour accélérer justement euh, la découverte, on va dire, ou la proposition, parce qu'il en existe, moi je suis beaucoup de ce sujet, et donc par rapport à, à des propositions technologiques qui ont besoin d'un effort commun et d'un financement beaucoup plus important. D'accord, ok, Merci. donc si j'ai bien compris, the, uh, so I'll, I'll repeat in English actually, so, so there's a question there around the European Green Deal and the role of the EU here, of how we can accelerate the timeline of the energy transition, and I think also and the... the CBAM, the CBAM. Yeah. And the CBAM, the CBAM, exactly. Iskander and then Harry maybe, and then we'll probably have to finish. I will check to see if there are any more questions online. Iskander. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a one, one quick comment, which I think uh, hopefully will be of, of interest for further discussion with the Ministry of, of, of Finance and, and colleagues from the EBRD. But obviously, there are some uh, interesting examples of precedents of credit lines being provided by the EBRD for energy uh, efficiency uh, and other uh, investments via, as, as Hassan, uh, I think, was alluding to, the, the, the Moroccan private banks. And so I think there's a coming opportunity for that in the um, distributed renewable energy space where I think a lot of the, uh, the businesses or, or households uh, that you're talking about uh, don't necessarily have the capital up front to make these investments that would nevertheless provide major uh, cost and energy saving uh, opportunities over the uh, uh, medium term. Um, so perhaps uh, an opportunity to, to explore uh, in that regard, and not just for Morocco, but I think across the region, uh, there's a, a vast uh, untapped uh, potential for uh, distributed power generation. Thank to get you. serious about. And then last question to Harry then. So it would be great if you could address that question of how EBRD is supporting the European, the EU's European Green Deal. And also there's a question that's come in online, and this wasn't from me, but would the EBRD consider um, uh, setting up some kind of coal retirement <laughs> a financial mechanism, a coal transition mechanism to help the EBRD, EBRD region uh, retire some of those coal plants early and accelerate the energy transition. Harry, last word over to you. Um, okay, so, you know, what, I think there were several different questions, actually, but I'll try to... What, what's the, what is the current crisis doing for um, the EU energy policy and EU carbon policy? Well, it's intensifying and accelerating it. The Green Deal's just going to get faster. Um, and that will also mean uh, likely higher carbon prices. I mean, you can argue that if more renewables will actually drive down the carbon price, but... I think it's very clear, many of you will know, the price of carbon in the European Union now is 
has been as high as 90 something euros a ton, it, it will go down a bit, it has gone down a bit, but it will, it will stay persistently at those levels and grow over time. Um, second, what is EBRD doing? Well, I, I don't have, I mean, I only have a couple of minutes, but I would need a couple of hours to list the many ways in which we support the Green Deal. But, you know, for us, the Green Deal covers electrification of, of yeah. heating, of transport, and it covers the greening of that electricity. Those are core to what we're trying to do. Um, in terms of what you can do to accelerate, well, I'll give you an answer which actually captures all of these questions, which is Morocco should introduce a carbon pricing scheme or an emissions trading scheme. And, and I understand that's under, under consideration, and that has a whole number of benefits. Um, number one, it insulates an economy against the CBAM. If you have your own carbon pricing mechanism then the Europe, that, that, that is comparable, then the European Union will not in, in, impose a carbon border adjustment. But much more importantly, it sends a pan-economy, an all-economy price signal to, renew, to energy producers and energy consumers that they need to find low-carbon sources. And that, in turn, stimulates entrepreneurs, scientists, innovators everywhere to come up with new solutions and clever solutions. You, do, you, know, you, you mentioned the frameworks we, we have in place, and these are important and tools, but we know that these frameworks are the second best solution. We put them in place because economies, all economies, not just Morocco's, but all economies, fail to price pollution, fail to price carbon. The best solution is to price pollution, and then the market, all of these brilliant, clever, hard-working, driven people in Morocco, as in every other country, will find the solutions. Thank Carbon so price, please. Thank you so much. So there we go. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's just have one quick look, if we can, at the illustration that our illustrator, Josh, has been doing. Uh, I'm seeing... No? Okay. We'll, we'll try and... That's very confusing. Uh, sorry? It's a video illustration. Well, hopefully we'll be able to bring the illustration up as we, as we finish the event. We're slightly over time, so I think we should probably leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us, those of you in the room, those of you online. It was really great to hear all your views. Thank you, and see you again next year in Uzbekistan. Thank you. Good job, Sonia. And development, EBRD. We work with governments, the private sector, and civil society across three continents. Civil society is vital to empowering public dialogue, promoting accountability, and ensuring the inclusion of underrepresented people. We engage with civil society through information, exchanging information about projects, policies, strategies, reports, and data. Accountability, monitoring environmental, social, and transparency concerns about EBRD financed projects and performing independent reviews. Civil society organizations and people affected by our projects raise these concerns. Dialogue. Facilitating dialogue between civil society and institutional leaders to share technical expertise and best practice. Consultations. Consulting civil society on the EBRD's policies, strategies, and projects. Collaboration. Strengthening the capacity of civil society through innovative technical cooperation programs. Partnerships. Fostering partnerships with civil society to support effective project implementation and to multiply impact. To learn more about our work with civil society, visit www.civilsociety.org.